Um, so I wanted to make sure that those photographers were included who you know, were documenting because they knew it was something important, not because it was a paid gig or something. And then I knew there were these certain images that are like ingrained in our collective consciousness. Um, Baby in the Crown, um, you know, all there's there was like a set of images that I was like, those photos have to be in here too. And then also, yeah, just paint a narrative over time of what those visuals said. Um, so yeah, so definitely in the 70s, it was like photographers coming up as the music came up. Joe Conzo, you know, he's a perfect example. He was friends with the Cold Crush Brothers. They went to high school together. He was not looking to be a photographer. They were like, we need someone to take photos of us at shows so we can put them on flyers, and the rest is history. Right. You have Ernie Penacoli in there, you know, yeah. another, another pioneering. Yeah, he was there, was there yeah. early when I got there. Yeah. Let me ask you this, um, and Carl, maybe you could jump in. And again, I'm going to take the liberty of kind of reminding folks, we were talking about this whole digital thing, but I'm reading the book, and folks are talking about cameras, and you're going, damn, what kind of camera is that? And right, right. Can you talk about what that was really like? To go back to the context you, part, you know. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, ahead. <laughs> to, uh, to go back to the context you part, uh, that was a very important part of our process, because you turned in that film. You didn't see that image immediately. And whether you were at a point of trying to create something that visually wasn't right there in front of you by either altering the film or shooting black and white, I'm not looking at black and white, I'm looking at color. But if you're shooting in black and white, you're seeing something very different. You have to visualize that. So if you choose to use either filters or some form of, uh, of a alteration of the image, then that was important. So we put the image, we put the film in the lab and we waited. Some how, of us, how long would the wait be? It, it depended on you know who you were. Sometimes I could say like, you know, give me my shit, <laughs> and then they would turn it around pretty quickly. Or if I was traveling, I'd have it already back at the hotel before we even left. So sometimes it'd be three, four days. So but, uh, if I took a picture, you know, let's say, you know, I don't know, Tupac walks in the room. I take a picture. He came back for the day. We're not going to be able to put it on Instagram. We have to wait for yeah. three Now, if you have a days. Polaroid, if you have a Polaroid, you, can, okay. you know, that's an instant Talk photograph. Right there. That's an instant photograph if you have a Polaroid. But you still can't get it onto this machine hmm. in that uh, quick of a way. So, so, yes, we have to wait. We have to wait. Did we mind that way? No, I sort of enjoyed the process of knowing that in a few hours or a few days, I'm going to get these contact sheets and I get a chance to go over them. And then it's just part of the process of shooting because we did the shoot, say, uh, Wednesday. And then here are the contact sheets on Thursday evening. And perhaps you're going to go sit somewhere and go over these contact sheets so you're removed from that moment, mm -hmm. which is sort of part of the process that's sort of brilliant in creating the image, or at least during that period. How do, how do you all you know, set up a shot so that you don't um, spend all day shooting something and then go home and realize that things were just messed up. And do you see the mess ups on these contact sheets? Either one of y'all can take that. Uh, you know, how did, how did you ensure that you were really going to capture that magic? Because, you know, we're so used to the digital thing, you can make a mistake and automatically adjust, but you had to be on point because you couldn't see. Well, going in, you need to know what you're doing first. Okay. So, you know, you can't just grab the tool and pretend as though it's going to function for you. You have to understand how light functions. Now, perhaps there might be a slip of the wrist or something like that that can happen that can alter a moment. Like, for example, on the Prussians here, this section is much lighter. Talk about at the bottom. Yeah, yeah that can happen on, on, a, on a proof sheet that's from 1 through 36. But for the most part, you go in with something in mind so that you can focus on that individual. Perhaps you're only going to get five minutes with it. Some artists, you only, you might get 15 minutes and it's a done deal. Hopefully you create an environment that will allow them to stay a little longer. Good. Hopefully I'm answering the question. Yeah, yeah no, I was, well, I was going to say, you know, part of what I wanted to do in this book was show the mistakes and show the happy accidents. You know, I think with photographers and with artists, you know, We've all been around artists in their early, early days when they're figuring it out, when they're given that moment to make their mistakes, to give, um, you know, Tupac was not Tupac, 
you know, he well, you had just died to burn at that point. <laughs> well, and, and so the same with photographers, you know, the contact sheets, you might get one shot out of 36 that works. Right. Um, you know, I wanted to show the overexposures, the underexposures, um, and I also wanted to show, you know, sometimes they were planned. A lot of, I wanted to have a lot of documentary shots in the book, too, um, to talk about how back in the day, like, uh, photographers would get a lot of access, definitely much more than today. Right. Um, sometimes you'd spend weeks with an artist, be a fly on the wall. Um, you know, there's, I don't know if we're right, I just, the, the next slide, um, you know, we'll go back to that one. But, you know, the book uh, shows, like, has this, the, these, these photos where you can sort of feel that the artist didn't, wasn't aware of the photographer being in the room. Um, you know, fo this is like Snoop's first uh, photo shoot. Um, and then this is Nas recording Illmatic in the studio. And, you know, photo photographers don't get access like this anymore, for the most part. Right. Well, one of the interesting things, and anybody can elaborate on that, in reading the book, you know, two things come up. The, one, there's this constant, how do you establish a relationship with this artist? I think in the Nas uh, photo, they talked about just don't come in there and shoot, but you know, get a vibe so you can actually be a part of the process. And with Snoop, you know, almost a similar type of thing, you know, where you take a picture here and then there's a shootout and there's all these different things going on. <laughs> no, really. I mean, that's what happened. There was like a shootout and then they had to come back and, you know, do all this stuff. So can we talk about, the, you know, how important is, is that to get a final product? Because I think what we're coming back to where we're at now is such an instantaneous thing. It's like I'm trying to capture you in when you don't know. I'm, I'm sneaking a shot. And we're doing all this Instagram thing. So let's talk about the importance of that process of having this 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 bond between photographer and artist. Uh, my turn. Yeah, you're the one taking them pictures. I'll, I'll, I will, I, but I will, I will set it. I will set it up to say to say this though. Let me let me. I'll tee it up with this. Is that so? There were really like four scenarios, right, under which these photos were taken. It was an album cover shoot, a magazine shoot, which is um, how I found out about you, you know, when you were shooting for Vibe um, a lot. Um, a shoot where, like, you're hired by the artist to, you know, be their, their in-house. And then there's um, these kind of press shoots or just kind of, you know, documentary moments. Right. Like this photo with Nas, Lisa, Lisa Leon, the photographer, she actually didn't remember why she was there oh. or what, like what it was for, you know, I, um, so it was, so, but, but for, for I mean, someone who shot a lot of album covers and magazine go, covers, it was different. It was if a different I go process. Back, Talk into if I go back, <laughs> here you go. <laughs> I feel like I should start rapping this and shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nope. No. <laughs> So if I go back to say, you know, like shooting with Dell or shooting with Dwayne or Dwayne Wiggins or Tony, right. early periods when you just are in the room, or if I'm hanging out with Tony Gilmore, who is like a DJ, and we just all hanging out together because that's just what we do, then those are those moments where you catch those photographs that are just you in the room, right? So those periods indeed do happen. Nowadays, we're a little bit prepared take my picture yes you got a phone shit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's that work that happens so we we're sort of lost with that sort of spontaneous moment or that one that you just catch where someone is on the sidelines which is like what i sort of like to sort of create like so if i can create a situation or in a room then i want to say like okay now i'm not paying attention to you now let me catch you so you have to sort of tiptoe around folks to get that sort of caught image, whereas before it just sort of naturally happened early on. Now we're all trying to be, we're all posing. We're all posing. We're all posing for shit. Vicki, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk about some of the photographers that are included in this book. 
um, and what you found to be some of the strengths and weaknesses of people. Like, if we get this book, what do you want them to kind of peep? You know, what do you, what do you want them to pay attention to? Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I guess I should mention, so my first uh, introduction to some of these photographers was from the side of the artist. Um, before I became a journalist, I, it's not in my bio read, but before I became a journalist at 19, I started working for an indie label called Payday Records Empire okay. Management. Um, and we, at the, our big group at the time was Gangstar. Right. Even though we also had Jay-Z for a singles deal, we had Mos Def's first group, we had Show and AG, um, right. all the kind of you know golden era groups. Um, Bahamadia, exactly. yes, who Guru yeah. brought in from Philly, That's what yes. Right there. Yeah, yeah. Really he young. is like way underrated on, right. if we're going to shout out some female right. MCs on International Women's Day, yeah. Bahamadia yeah. for sure. She was raw, yes. one of the best yeah. ever, <laughs> ever. Um, but so, so working with those groups, um, I was their director of PR and marketing, so I would tour with them. I was their liaison to the media, and so a lot of the photographers in the book um, I met when they were taking photos and kind of negotiating that moment mm -hmm. with me. And um, you know, and I, I remember it was even like Guru, rest in peace. You know, he he would like he thought very deeply about his image. He understood that his image was very much representative right. of the, what, the work that he was putting out there. Um, you know, when he made the choice to put a portrait of Malcolm X on the cover of Daily Operation behind him and Premier, that was really thought through and I won't say not agonized over, but thought deeply about. Right. And I really, um, I always respected the photographers who understood that versus like, do this, do that, you know, that, that process right. of like, this is a human being really trying to put some work out into the world and they don't, you know, like, they don't know, or they may feel uncomfortable, or they may, you know, kind of want to say something with their visuals. So I met, um, I met a lot of photographers through that way. And they were the first ones that I went to for this book because they okay. knew me, they trusted me. Also, like, people showing people Trust. their contact sheets. Trust y'all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, like, Carl, he, Carl, like, saved his high-res files until the last minute to send Trust. me. He was like, are you sure this is going to be a book? Are you sure? If I send you high-res files, I better not see them on eBay. <laughs> so, but, but so, yeah. So, so you know, that, that early 90s photography group of most people that were doing magazine shoots. Right. Um, Sue Kwan, you know, Lisa right. Leon, um, Chimo Du, Jonathan Mannion, Carl, um, you know, those, that's sort of where I started. Yeah. So, so this is what I noticed, and then we'll go through some of these slides. It seemed like uh, in the 70s, when I look at the photos, there is a documenting of the neighborhood. Like if you're in Brooklyn, Jamal Shabazz captures Brooklyn. If you look at that picture, that's how you dress, that's how you stood, that's what it looked like, that's the dirt on the ground, that's the graph on the wall, right? Um, you caught the Bronx, you caught these, these images. And then it seemed like as we got into the 90s, especially towards the golden era, you saw, as you said, people like Guru were like, I'm gonna put Malcolm here, public enemy very aware of their image, and it seemed like it was just focused. And like, I don't know what's going on in Brooklyn in the 90s. I just see pictures, right, right. of the artists themselves. And then it seemed like it, it scaled back a little bit. You started to see, you know, I call it the posse cuts. It's the Big Al, uh, uh, um, Biggie. So many people, it looks like the whole neighborhood is showing up. And they got to be in the picture. And, you know, Wu-Tang and all that. And then I don't know where it's at now, but it seems like, um, I don't know what the theme is now, but it seems like it's it's ebbed and flowed. How how have you seen it change over the years? Yeah, I mean, you and and also what I thought was so interesting is you know these photos because hip hop you know there were different pockets of it, right? Different regions. Like I remember, like like it blew a lot of people's minds when they saw photos of like what the West Coast looked like 
or vice versa, like probably here in the Bay, you would get certain magazines or be like, oh, that's what they're wearing in you know, Brooklyn, or oh, that's, that's the style, you know, and everyone. And so it was like these little um, ways to communicate when hip hop was really still pretty underground, you know? Um, still a subculture, and you know, all these little magazines and album covers would make their way, and it was like mind blowing because we were starved for images. Right. Remember, like before Instagram, before all of it, like yeah. how would you see what it looked like? Like you would hear, but you know, when you saw, mm -hmm. you were like, your mind was blown. When yeah, you, and it seemed like, you know, outside of New York, there was an emphasis on bringing, like, if you took a too short shot. You gotta let everybody know it's Oakland or Mac Dre. Yes. You know, you right. gotta know it's Vallejo. If not Oakland, it's Vallejo, right? right. And if it was Herm or RBL, it's Frisco. You know, you right. gotta know it's the something. You know, so it seemed like there was this emphasis, like you got to know the where landmark. we're at. You know, the landmark, yeah. 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 Can we go through some of your things? Let's just highlight some yeah, of these things. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so this is early, early Fuji's. Um, you know, Lauren, I was, I was interested to see how certain artists sort of were at the very beginnings of their career, um, and then, you know, over time, but Lauren, like everyone that photographed her were like, she was just, she had it. She had that certain magic right, right from the start. Um, this what was, was it like, did they describe what it was like working with her? You know, was she a prima donna or was she no, real down no. to earth? It's <laughs> <laughs> people in the back. Can I get a stand or something? <laughs> uh, you should speak on that image because that's not Carl. But no, she wasn't a prima donna at all. She knew what she was doing, and uh, she was sort of a. She was sweet. She was. She was cool. She was chill. Um, and we shot three times together, so I got an opportunity to hang early with it in the studio, and then. Uh, so just a cool woman, you know, and that's a great question because every artist is very different. And some we can go in the room with and we won't chat about that. And then others will go in the room with and be like, wow, what an experience. Right. Uh, so to speak on her specifically, uh, just quite kind, there for you, giving, and then also, you know, she was in uh, soap operas early, so yeah. she knew how to she knew sort how of Hollywood. So let me ask you this uh, before we go. Lawrence comes at a time when, you know, in, in videos that are being shown, there was a trend to have, I'll call it racial ambiguity. Is she black? Are they black? You know, you saw all that, right? Here you have this chocolate skin woman, right? That's in sharp contrast to what is being, you know, uh, promoted. How important is it to really capture that blackness, that essence of it? Because you're making a statement, even with her natural locks and the whole nine, at a time when people were in a different direction, at least in terms of what was being presented to the mainstream? Or do you even think about that as a, as a photographer? Well, she, you know, her rhyme spoke for her. Oh. Her rhyme spoke for her. You know, you knew what you were getting. So it was just a matter of capturing that woman. You know, you didn't have to prepare. You know, she is who she is. She, there isn't, uh, if she was walking down the street here, you're gonna get Lauren Hill. Right, so you didn't have to necessarily put on a costume. Well, what I mean by that, I know photographers now who are like, it's really important to capture the tone, the skin, the, the essence of black folks because it's often not really seen in its pure beauty, you know? And so I remember when they were talking about the marketing of Lauren, that it was important that people realize like, here's a sister that is going to come in a way that most people in the community would recognize, but in mainstream, let's go back to that time, you didn't often see a Lauren Hill in the in, in you know up front. You know, that's what I'm Well hip hop wasn't up front, period, first. So, you know, that was that was, you know, yeah. that's a given. You know, we weren't on the cover of the magazine that we desired to be on. It just didn't happen, regardless. Right. But she got on Time magazine. At some point. Yeah. yeah. But at first, when we're talking about early on, there was okay. a lot of play mm -hmm. early on where that didn't necessarily happen. So I don't know if we wanted to say we're going to mainstream you. We just were saying we're going to make sure that you are presented as you are. Okay. And then time will serve 
Okay. And then it will share. It'll come. It'll come. At least in my, in my mind. That's okay. how you produce that sort of word. You don't put a you don't you don't uh, put on a coat. Right. For it. You had. I mean, you had a lot of women in this moment when Lauren was coming out. Right. You had Erica Badu. Uh, who's not exclusively hip hop? Latifah. Was still Latifa. It was all interesting. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. No. Latifa was playing back then. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I feel like well, here's and here's the public enemy shot that you were talking about. But I feel like women um, back then were really embracing this this moment, um, and you know to show that was super important. Right. And you know to answer your question about. Um, the way photographers were thinking about portrayals in you know in the media and how they were going to change that like Baron Claiborne who shot the Biggie and the Crown photo which we'll show in a moment he you know he tells this story in the book where he was like um, you know he's like I was a young black man and he was like everything I saw in the media of black men was negative at the time he's like I didn't want to play into that as a photographer um, I wanted to portray Biggie as a king for that reason. And so if you look at that photo, which we'll see in a minute, it's got a lot of purple, red, yellow, like very regal colors. Like that was a very conscious thing. And if you look at like Baron Claiborne's work in general, that you feel that regalness, you feel that respect, you feel, um, you feel that is someone that understands how they're portraying, and also the work of Jamel Shabazz, who we'll show in a minute. I mean, he stopped people on the street and said, I see great, hold on, I see greatness in you. Right. May I take your photo? And you can see that in the way people hold themselves. They right. feel that respect from the that's photographer. That, that's that bond you're talking about, that relationship. I mean, it's just a matter of, it, it, in America, you know, the work it's it's coming it's it's it's, it's having it's, it's it's coming going back folks are curious about this period and these things that we were doing so long ago that weren't recognized right and now it has power let's talk about this before we go with public enemy because chuck d is a graphic designer um is very you know i've had long conversations with them about the images that they always put out. Nothing was done out of chance. So let's talk about this, you know, the you know, little bit of uh, gems behind this photo. Yeah, so this um, this is the cover of uh, Public Enemies, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, which came out in 1988. Um, you know, this photo is the, the album cover, and this photo is the contact sheet that photographer Glenn Friedman showed. Um, they, the concept of the, the album cover was that, um, that they were breaking out of a jail, um, you know, and all the, you know, iconography that goes with that. So this bottom right photo was supposed to be the cover right. of the shot. Um, but then, you know, if you remember back then, the cassette format and the album format was just really, the shape oftentimes made for the selection of, of the image. So people don't know, cassettes were <laughs> People don't know, cassettes were, cassettes, they were like about this big, and you put them in a, in a, in a radio thing, and you press it, and it played, and that's what we used to listen to. We just had a demo. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> this is a lot of younger folks here. They, they don't know what the cassette is. You said they don't know what the cassette is. But, 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 so, more seriously, you had to adapt for the album, you had to adapt for the 12 inch, you had to adapt for the cassette. So these were different things, right? Just like you have to adapt for Instagram now, the square. Yeah, you gotta put the square. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so, yeah, and so, you know, this, they actually, this, this almost was a disaster because Glenn um, feels and felt very strongly about his work and his decisions, and he's collaborative, but to a point. Right. And so the group you see here, like the front cover group choice, was not Glenn's choice um, at all, and he actually threatened to just scratch all these negatives 
unless they listen to him. And there was this moment, he writes about it in the book, where Hank Shockley, one of their producers, was like, don't do that. <laughs> Let's figure it out. Anyways, and the, the rest is history. Um, this, you know, this photo, this is Fab Five Freddy in the South Bronx, taken in 82. Um, you know, this photo, it's hard to see, but I love this contact sheet. And this was just a documentary shot. They just went out right. one afternoon, photographed. Um, you captured White Castle. That's my neighborhood. Yes. Yeah, so, that was right so, there next to Bronxdale right. on Buster Boulevard. Which is like a, a hip-hop yeah. thing. A little, a little explain detail. White, white Castle, Castle here. Castle. <laughs> explain cassettes. Explain White because Castle. Right? It's a frozen <laughs> soap. So <laughs> on on it. On it. Listen. Ask for it. Every, okay, well, every city has its 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 uh, favorite burger, and so every every six months when I feel like trolling people, I will go on Facebook or something, and I'll be like, "White Castle smashes on In and Out," and then you know, like, you get a whole bunch of people from LA that want to argue, and then somebody will toss in fat burgers, and then people from the Bay have like these one-stop shots, like you know, the one on East Fourteenth is the best thing, but you know, White Castle is is it was like you know the small little burgers you get like 50 of them and this is like this is this is our thing you know it's like i love white castle you know? and people will be like it was greasy you know what white castle was our quick way if you're old enough to remember the same way i was about to say the same thing that was our quick way that was our quick way Right? So all these little secrets, right? Like this is exactly what I was hoping for. Like all these little details, if you know, you know, which is like so hip hop too, right? Little details, little things you pick up about someone's wearing, little, you know, polo shirt or this or that. You're like, okay, I, kn I know about you. Like I see, you know, decoding right. and communicating. And so, yeah, and so <laughs> the photo of White Castle, and then also, you know, you look at the contact sheets, you see what the South Bronx was at that time, too, which has changed so much with, you know, gentrification. And now they have condos. Yes. And, and then, now they're, they're called it Sobro. And they also have yeah. vegan, vegan yeah. burgers yeah. At, yeah. at White Castle. No. They're delicious. No. No. <laughs> I had one last no. week. <laughs> <laughs> Impossible burger, yes. See all these folks are leaving. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> 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 like, we're so like, we're done. We're out. We're out. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 Um, Look, there's no vegan burgers at White Castle, folks. You have to stay. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this photo was taken by um, the great Gordon Parks, um, a great day in hip hop. Um, it was the cover of XXL Magazine uh, in 1998. Um, this photo was sort of like a class photo of, of hip hop at the moment. And it was also the moment that a lot of people say that, um, you know, New York kind of lost its dominance. Um, this is when Atlanta, New Orleans, Memphis um, really started to have their moment in hip hop. But this photo was significant. It brought it together two generations. So you had like the Rock Hymns, the Fat Five Freddies, the Slick Ricks, and then you had like Most Def, The Roots, Common, like all guys that I think had like just put out their album. So right. it was a great meeting of the minds. Gordon Parks photographed it. It was based on um, an earlier jazz photo from the 50s. So they wanted to like recreate that moment in the same location on 126th Street in Harlem. Um, and it just became, you know, this this classic photo. Um, Harlem too has changed. You know, I was I was on that block a couple weeks ago. It's all, you know, beautifully redone. Um, so it's really uh, a moment in time. Now, in the book, they talked about, you know, not everybody understood the significance of Gordon Parks. Can we talk a little bit about that? And you know, uh, just when he's taking this picture, do they realize like this is this is you know, a freedom fighter, iconic photographer. Not everyone. I mean, some people did, and right. some people were really in awe that, wow, like Gordon Parks, um, who, you know, it was this Renaissance man, directed Shaft, wrote many books, like had photographed the civil rights movement. Um, and really, you know, it was significant because he was, as the first black photographer for life, 
really Less captured everyday. everyday people and and showed showed people you know just being normal, taking their kids to school, uh, buying groceries, things like that. Which, believe it or not, at the time was very um, uh, different. Okay. And and so yeah, so when he took this photo, some people knew, some people did not know who he was, but um, but it was it was really you know the editor in chief of XXL. Um, she tells a story that she like had to beg and plead Gordon Parks to take this photo, um, because again, this was a time when not everyone took hip hop that seriously, and asking someone of Gordon Parks' stature to photograph a class photo of hip hop, he had to see that. He had to see that this was and a you legacy. Have, and in this one, you have a lot of the pioneers, as well as you know the red men and the EPMDs who were, you know, coming up at that time. Were you so. there that day? No. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's an incredible photo. Uh, I wonder if it would resonate today. I don't even think it could be possible this yeah. day because, you know, the, the way this photo even happened is incredible too because there was um, a publicist named Leslie Pitts, yep. who you, I'm sure you remember, um, the sort of legendary woman. Um, also rest in peace. Also rest in yep. peace. Um, and essentially she, put out the word to all her fellow publicists by phone, by beeper. Right. You want to say what beeper is? Beeper. Right. <laughs> we, we need so, like a cheat sheet. Right. So before, there was a, before there was cell phones, there was a little device. Like you would get this number, it would show up, and you would make a phone call on a pay phone. It would be like a quarter. And if you, if you had a boyfriend or girlfriend, you could type the four backwards, and you could say, I love you. So before that, yeah, you, yeah, you, can, so you can communicate. This is before the iPhones. That was a big deal. You was balling. And then there was Sky Pages. He was really, you know, on some next level stuff. <laughs> So, yeah, so this photo, I mean, imagine in this day and age, someone says every rapper from every city is going to be on this block at 2 p.m. on Saturday. Like, you'd have more fans. I mean, it'd be on social, it'd be everywhere, but, you know, just the fact that it was happening. And also, the NOI was security that day, right. so it was kept very... There's a great documentary on YouTube um, by Nelson George, I highly recommend. Uh, about this about this day. And so there was a West Coast equivalent, I'll come to you in a second. There was a West Coast equivalent to this that was a great day in LA uh, when everybody came out. Um, so I was in that one, but then they did, it, it hasn't come out. The, the guy who took it hasn't put it out, but it was uh, everybody from the very beginnings, like the Egyptian lovers and you know Wrecking Crew all the way up to the NWAs. And uh, I wish that would come out because that was in, that was kind of to Complement what was done in New York. You had a question. Can you shout in the back? Real quick. Yeah. Um, one, you mentioned the documentary. You got another name of it? Uh, I think it's called A Great Day in Hip Hop. Great. Yeah. Uh, and then I just wanted to, to compliment that you, as a 25 year old, have done a great job. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I read a lot of books here. And, you know, and I Google a lot of stuff, so I'm up on this stuff. <laughs> But thank you for recognizing my age. <laughs> I hope y'all got that. It's on tape, I'm 25, and that's that. <laughs> but I think um, I think E40 was the only Bay Area. Hammer was there too. Who was? I think Hammer uh, ah! was there too. <laughs> <laughs> um, who was that? Hammer. Yeah. Sorry, I'm slapped. Oh, okay. <laughs> Because Hamlet? Because E40? No, he was telling the story. They were there, that brother was there that day, and the only person he talked to was E40. They had this whole E40 story. Oh. And Mickey said the only LA, you know, the only California person was oh, E40. Yeah. Confirming that his story was totally true. <laughs> yeah. But I think Hamlet was there because that's when he had that talk with Redman. Mm. I think yeah, he was yeah, there. He's yeah. not in the photo. He's not in the photo, but he was definitely. There were a lot of people that were there that were not in the photo. Uh, Shaq was there. D'Angelo. A young D'Angelo. <laughs> a young D'Angelo. <laughs> um, Anybody know who this is? Three steps, uh, Andre. Okay. What's the story behind this? This is a pose. This is a pose. This is a pose. Um, and this is also, you know, Andre 
back then used to make a lot of his own clothes and uh, you know wear them to photo shoots. So he made everything that he's wearing. He made that hat. I, I was just gonna say I don't know about the I don't know about the hat, but he had like a jacket that came off, but in the pants. Maybe the hat. He um, had the flag made for that was the cover of Stangonia, the album. Um, but again, like artists who just really, it was important to them what, how they were portrayed, how they were shown, what they wore. Um, this is a Jeanette Beckman photo of Andre right before they put out Hey Ya. Um, she tells a story that, you know, they were playing the song during the photo shoot and they were like, what do you think of the song? Do you like it? It's gonna be our new single, um, and you know, and she, Jeanette Beckman, got these these great moments, and you know, I hesitate to call them style moments. I mean, I did try to point out as many like style elements of the book because um, hip hop had great style, um, but also a little bit more important, like style as a as a way to talk about um, again how the artist wanted to be portrayed um, and little little. Signifiers that were that were important now, to them. There's some markings on the contact sheet. Is that to be like somebody go do not put this out at all, and then they <laughs> mark it up so that guarantees it. Yeah, I mean, photographers all have their own way of marking. So you know, a lot of these contact sheets were used as working documents. So you'd work with an editor, you'd work with an artist, or you just kind of for your own notes would make little markings like this one's good, this one's good, this one's bad. Um, usually an X meant like not good and then a, you know, you'd circle the one that you like. I don't know, you probably had your own way of marking up contact sheets, if at all. Um, <laughs> and I was more thinking before I was going to pick up the mic. Of course, we have a method of marking. Uh, they're grease pencils. So at some point when we get to Carl's and I can pretty much make a note in reference to, but also you would give these contact sheets to art directors. So you might send a set to them and then they would make markings and then you would have them messengered back to you and then you'd go and produce prints. Uh, sometimes we make circles, sometimes we look at them and later on say, that's a definite or nah, change my mind, and opposed to a, finding a napkin to remove the mark, you would just put an X through it. So. He played with these contact sheets and he kept them over time. Did you ever have a situation where you had to redo the photo shoot because they were just so, you know, like after it came out, it's like, you messed me up, you made me. Uh, I had a situation in Baltimore where they stole my shoe. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no they, well, someone broke in the car and stole the shot film. No. So. When that happened, I had to do a do over. You didn't call the bark sales? <laughs> <laughs> the bark sales. I was running around Michael. <laughs> Stringer Bell so, wasn't around. Yeah. <laughs> so in that, that moment, that's that's one that comes to mind. A reshoot, I did do an ad shoot for AT&T once where the, uh, the client had one thing in mind, the ad agency had another. So it wasn't Afrocentric enough for the client. And then the ad agency tiptoed around that. So that was a reshoot. So those are two okay. that come to mind. And when you have to do a reshoot, that's not fun. You gotta call everybody back. You gotta, you know, you gotta turn around and say, let's do this again. So it's not that same dynamic. And then with the ad agency, you're like, damn, am I doing this shit for free? So, you know, it's, it's all of those things come into play when you have a redo. So those are two that come to mind straight away. And I'll go, I'll go a little faster because I definitely want to make sure we get to Carl's photos. But this is Salt and Peppa um, by Jeanette Beckman. You know, this photo is super cool because um, the And super famous. And, and super out. famous. Um, and actually in a big litigation. I actually spent my whole day on the phone about this photo, which I can share. Um, but... What I wanted to point out first is the jackets that they're wearing are by Dapper Dan, mm -hmm. which I, you guys are probably you know following the Gucci situation in the news right now. 
Um, but you know, Dapper Dan, when this photo was taken, was like the guy that that would like remix, you know, luxury brands for you know street hustlers, rappers, drug dealers. Um, so yeah, so these jackets are are really really important. And I'll tell the so super and, quick and play, yeah play from play kid, play, play from Kitty Play designed this. This is his design. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, and it's super sad because I guess um, they're in litigation right now that Spinderella is out of the group. Um, so they're, they're, they're trying to sort of think about, you know, which images are out there in the world. Um, the second Spinderella is out? Yes. Um, so, yeah, so this, you know, this photo kind of speaks to, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so this photo, you know, it's it's a big photo. We have a show opening at Annenberg Space for Photography in LA uh, next month, and this is like one of our key photos. So, you know, we were we were talking about it about it today. Um, this is uh, Wu Tang's uh, cover, Thirty Six Chambers. Um, this this is a photo by by Danny Hastings, and it was also you know significant because they didn't show their faces on the album cover, which was like a big a big deal at the time to not show your face because there was this sort of like typical like hey it's our album, um, but the reason why they they didn't show their face they they were planning to but not everyone showed up, yeah. <laughs> um, and the the photographer six of the nine. Only six yeah. out of nine showed up. Yeah. That happened often. Yeah. With Wu Tang or with everyone? Well, yeah, that's a lot of people to show up. But, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but the photographer thought quickly on his feet and he actually remembered there was, um, he had been at a show a, a couple months prior at these, um, there used to be a lot of like conventions. Yeah. Jack the Rapper, uh, New Music Seminar. Um, that's kind of where you would go to kind of like hear the artists before they came out or break new artists. And um, Wu Tang actually ended up like hijacking the stage in stocking masks for that show. The photographer was there and he like thought quickly when they sh not all of them showed up. He was like, instead of being like, oh, we have to reshoot, we have to reschedule. And he's like, remember that show at Jack the Rapper where you guys like bum rush the stage with the stocking mask? He's like, let's do that. Yeah, and they, they were like, somebody off the stage that yeah. was in the middle of their show, and they just Wu Tang ain't nothing half with, and then also <laughs> on YouTube. Yeah. Yes, I highly recommend it. <laughs> um, this is uh, Eric B and Rakim's "Follow the Leader," also Dapper Dan jackets. Um, Freddie from Family Affair Gallery. For those of you who missed his his show of these photos a couple months ago. Uh, look on his Instagram. <laughs> so there's a couple of things. The yeah. fact that Rakim is breaking the tradition and you see his back. So can you talk about that a little bit? Because that's, that's an intentional pose. Yeah, well, for two reasons. So one, you know, for album cover shoots, you usually show your face. Um, and two, you know, he, these Dapper Dan jackets, um, he's wearing a jacket that was designed, um, it's the, the Nation of Gods and Earths, 5% Nation, you see the seven, you see the crescent, um, which, you know, Rick Rockham really wanted to show in the photo. Um, this jacket, by the way, is also gonna be in our Annenberg show. We got uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to lend it to us. So I'm very, very excited. It's going to be. Yeah. And also, I think he said, um, since it was for follow the leader, you would see his back more than his face. So it's like, since he's the leader, you follow him. Right. So, and the other thing I thought was good is that this is Eric B's car. This is really his car. It's not a rented, you know, thing for the day. This is what the brother drove. <laughs> yes. But they kind of, I think that's important because at the time, they really, when they stunted, it wasn't like, it was the real deal. That whole Fort Greene crew and what they represented was uh, it was there was that was really authentic. There was no, nothing fake about it. So yeah, yeah, and you know you talk about choices and it's like the, that message of the come up. Like I have this. I have, you know so those choices of actually showing certain things in the photos. Um, there is a photo shoot with with Jay's Jay Z's first photo shoot. Um, he did not own any of those things yet, but he like he took the photographer, he's like, I want to take a photo with a yacht. So they went down to World Trade Center. 
posed in front of a yacht. Um, he, there was a Lexus, which I actually think he did own at the time. But, um, but it's interesting because you see later photos of Jay-Z and it's none of that stuff. Right. It's almost like this, you know, by the time you can afford it, the car is important. Like, right. um, so that, and that comes out in photos, right? Mm -hmm. This like, we don't need, or he doesn't need um, these, these signifiers of wealth. Um, so uh, now we get to, to Paul. I will let you do the honors of walking through these photos. Um, so your archive is is incredible. Um, I there's Carl has two shoots in the book, but obviously many 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 more contact sheets, uh, many it's more like photos. Carl has a whole book here. Yes. With everybody from Dell. With to, contact sheets in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he got everybody from he got KRS One smiling, skinny KRS One. Wow. He got different versions of Lil Kim. He got Common. He got everybody in the team. Well, I'm still so I mean, you know, I mean, she looked very different in in, in both both you know shoots. Yeah. Yeah. So. And uh, yeah, and a lot of you know souls of mischief, uh, alcoholics like. Um, so I, when we're afterwards, um, Carl said, any only anyone who wants to come and see his portfolio uh, is welcome to come and come and look. Um, so who's this? Carl? Uh, you don't know who that is? No. Buster. Buster. Okay. Yeah. I'm just kidding. I know who it is. Buster. <laughs> because Buster is so much bigger now, you know. And most people know Buster. Not from the leaders of the new school, they know the big buster. So you sit there like, who is that? Right, right. Right, right. I mean, this is when he was solo for certain. Yeah. But yes, he was a slim cat. He went to Hollywood and got a little fat cat. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it happens so with age. He would say small. He would say small. But uh, adjacent to him is Method Man, so it's two different contact sheets. So you can see in this one, I'm just sort of playing around with my. Uh, Composition. So the one with the flag that's sort of multiple uh, images of him. Um, that's just sort of me playing around about crops and how I want to go about it in the end. Did and you want the American one. flag in there? Yes, yes. I, I did that um, on purpose uh, because, you know, this, this game started here. And it's important that we recognize it at some point 100 years from now. 10 years from that period and today, that this is an American game that started here and perhaps it didn't get the, the, the spotlight that it deserved, but I knew it is, I know it's coming. I know it's coming and it's here. So, so I purposely went to, uh, this is uh, in New Jersey at uh, Liberty Park, where the Statue of Liberty is. And we, I like to isolate people places on occasion. So this was a moment that I take you out of your element and then we go and play for a little while. And I know he's quite open and uh, you know, not almost animated, but his character, you know, he knows how to give energy. He's quite energetic. So that's why we went there to do this shoot and I in my mind it worked perfect. And Method Man plays the guitar? Method Man plays the guitar. Like that was, really does I mean that was he really play? Well I don't know if he's oh. uh, you know a concert artist but <laughs> he plays the guitar. That was, that was his tool that came along. So it wasn't a prop. Uh, it was no, it was his tool okay. uh, that he had. Um, and we just sort of put it in for this moment as we were loosening up and getting ready for the shop. So this location is uh, at the Staten Island Ferry uh, subway entrance. So we were doing the 107th campaign. So we took certain artists to their environments that they were from. Uh, Red Man is from Jersey, he's from Staten Island, so we shot there at the Staten Island Ferry, and that's just one of the outtakes from the shoot. Now, did you kind of guerrilla this, or were you able to just, you know, uh, uh, did you have combination to, get permission of, to combination of both. So I had people with me, so if we needed to get permits or get approval, then right. we did sort of st uh, start with guerrilla style because I wanted people to recognize that he was there. And they love their artists, so they were quite happy to see him there. So we just uh, sort of started out that way, and they got some permission, and it worked out fine. Okay. I did have to get permission at the uh, the park. That was the hard tag. Yeah, really? Even though we were isolated and alone, that was probably a six hundred dollar fee. 
So this is, it looks like. So that's the coupe. That's right. Yeah, and this is their uh, first cover. I'm just looking at Pam. Right, and rest in peace as well. Yeah. 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 Yep. So we also just recently lost Pam, which is, uh, you know, was shocking. Because I had just seen her, you know, she was playing, you know, she was DJing and having a good time. Yeah. Right? So, uh, DJing for Prince. Yeah. So she was having a good time and she was out there. And, uh, you know, and being back in Cali, I got a chance to run up on her and we chatted and spent some time together, which was great. Um, but, you know, and then she was taken ill. What was going on in this photo here? Where was it? What was, what was going on at that time? Uh, this is an album cover. So this is sort of. Their debut album, right? Was it yeah, this is, um, yeah. Kill my yeah, Kill My Landlord uh, yeah. project. So this is an apartment in East Oakland, and we set out, we sat down and talked about what we had in mind, or what he had in mind for the project. And back then, which was great, about we talk about album covers and when an artist has something in mind. The great thing about early on in your craft is that you have that luxury to say things. Whereas when you get to a larger label and you start to play with them, then they come in and start to sort of try to persuade you to go in different directions. So with this, this is an apartment in East Oakland and we uh, just sort of set up and played with some of the things that were in the house. You know, it's, none of it's propped or bought. Now Boots was in film school, you know, and was, uh, you know, that was his thing, which, you know, we're all, now knowing right so when he came you know but at that time so that he came in there with a whole understanding and etc of what he wanted to do or were you like the expert that was going to no 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 I, I can't say no no i wasn't the expert he, he knew he had an idea he, he knew where they were going you know this this group has always known where they're going with their music outside of the, the film part so there was an idea and then we collaborated and we talk about how to make that image feel real right. and honest and then at the same time have some sort of power that it makes sense today. So uh, that's the collaborative part, but he definitely had an idea of where it was going. Right. Okay. Go ahead. Now, now who are these people? <laughs> uh, so here, this is editorial. Uh, this is the uh, the alcoholics, and uh, it was a shoot for Rap Pages cover. Um, I happened to be a friend. I mean, a friend of mine worked at the uh, the shop, Keep Hearing Shop. So I this day I went out for. I just felt like I wanted to do street art, and then combine it with this shop. And it's just a great graphic. Is this the one in New York. Yeah, this is okay. the one that was uh, in New York right off of uh, Houston. Yeah. You know, now they've turned that whole shop into a museum. They broke it down and now it's a museum. But anyway, we, we set up. Once again, I run a gun, went in there, didn't have to pay anything. Shop owner was like, cool, let's go for it. I was like, are you sure? He was like, yeah, let's do it. I said, all right. So uh, we rolled up. Go ahead. Did you want it this way or was that, an, uh, you know, kind of like you knew you wanted to have the hands? That's Carl that Posey. That's, that's Carl Posey. Okay, that's your style. Yeah, that's that's sort of me saying, you know, make it energetic, feel strong, and layers. Okay. You know, it has layers to it. So we see And that radio like, is there on right. purpose. It's not in a comfortable position at all. You okay. can't tell. But you can't, you know, you don't feel that. The cassette tape is important. Yeah. It dates it properly. So uh, that's, you know, that's just one of those moments, and we continue. The Adidas is that that's them. Yeah. You know, I didn't set the stage for the clothing. So if we see anybody who does a shot like that, it'd be like, oh, you trying to do a pose. Can <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I drop the mic? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's called posing style. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is uh, somewhat, you know, I just, you know, I like to squat and move around and find my angle. And so you're on the ground when you're doing this? Yeah, this is a two and a quarter square too, so when you're shooting that, that house of our frame, you know, you get a chance to really play with that square, and that's sort of how that panned out. The cover was nice too. The cover, the pan color, and uh, it's a, it was a great project. I love this image because it's just got layers of information. Just 
land. Yeah, so uh, you want to say anything first? No, on this? Go, ahead. go ahead. You know this, baby. I you know think, this, you, you know, I think this is too short. I, this is what I, <laughs> this what I was yes, told. It's, it's too short. It's the, uh, he did these things back uh, before uh, traveling uh, called a player's ball. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. And is that with the Scottish Rite? Yes. <laughs> so I was lucky enough to be invited. I have my tool. And, uh, was you this at Scottish Rite? This was at the Scottish okay. Rite. I believe, okay. yes. Because there was one at uh, Polly Ball. Oh, yeah. I think this is the Scottish Rite. Audience, can somebody help me? Because there was one at Polly Ballroom with Easy e and everybody when they what? came, and I remember that one. It could be. What, what I was told. Yeah, yeah. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, it's, 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 you know, it's one of those yeah. moments, and I was invited, and, you know, it just, when you're in the room, it's just happening. You don't have to. Do anything but be there and let it flow. So uh, that's a few of the shots from that moment. What was this for? Uh, this was also a Rap Pages uh, story. And this was back, you know, Lil' Kim came to the house. I didn't have no assistance. Those are the Twin Towers behind you. Yeah, so I lived in Soho at the moment, right there on Broome Street. So we just hit the streets. We played inside for a little while. Uh, it was what, a what year was this about? Say again. What year was this? Uh, this is probably 93, 90, 94? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 93, 94, somewhere in there. So, what was, uh, it, what was it like working with her? Because she's, she's just coming out now, right? Yeah, she was cool. She, you know, was, she was young, she was ambitious, she was funny. You know, she would laugh with you and chat with you, and, you know, it was just, it was a good time. No stress about, I gotta get out of here. No stress about craft services and what I need. You know, we should just in my little loft, you know. Just chilling. So we had a you know, we had a great day. I got a lot of work out of that uh, out of her that day. And she loved the clothes and loved the time spent and we hit the streets and you know, it was just great energy because we're walking down the middle of West Broadway right there. So that was again one of the layers of information that's in this photograph. You know, it's like the World Trade Center there. So that date do I have a clue that that wouldn't be there? No, but I knew that it was behind yeah. her in that moment. It's interesting too, because um, like a question that I get asked a lot about how did I select which images of women would be in the book? And also what kind of woman, right? Like Latifa versus Lil' Kim versus Nicki Minaj versus, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about, um, you know, how women are portrayed, how they decide to portray themselves. Um, you know, this photo, like Kim, uh, was one of the first to kind of like use that like hypersexuality um, to put her album out. And I remember I was working, Payday was on Lower, Bro on Lower Broadway as well. And I remember yeah. there was one morning, street teams, right, like was, was a thing. You'd wake up and you would see like whoever's album was dropping that week you would see their poster like plastered everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere it was like. And I remember the morning that, um, you know, going to work and, and seeing the poster plastered for Hardcore, Lil' Kim's Hardcore. And there was like, it wasn't the album cover, it was like the alternate, there were like two album covers. Okay, not the, the one with the lollipop. The more raunchy one, yeah, yeah <laughs> was, plastered all over, you know, downtown Manhattan. And it was such a wild moment. I mean, again, now I feel like it wouldn't be as big a deal, but it was like, you remembered where you were when you saw that poster. Yeah, she was, she was, she was, she was quite open, you know, she, she was open. She was open to play and have a good time with it. Um, and I don't mean exploit herself in that way because it's a different period now. She just was open to say, I'm boss like, and I'm cool with it. Right. And let's shoot this shit, and we're not going to have sex. we just going to shoot, and I'm going to move on. Yeah. Right? So it was just, it was just a, a period. I shot her for Players Magazine. And she was open, you know, and we, you know, she, we got the work done, and she was young, but she was open. Before we move on, um, 
Does anyone have any questions or comments or something? Go ahead. I have a few questions. Talk um, around some kids. Is this six four five cross street sweeping? Say again. The image right there of the squares, is that six four five like No, nah, it's two and a quarter square house of block. Okay. And then my second question was, what was the shop for? Because I'm not seeing the images of the The opposite of the thing I want to say. No, no, the shop for uh Rap pages. Rap pages. Yeah. Talking. Rap pages cover. Yeah. Two and a quarter square house of black. And an actual black and white in the desert. Anybody else? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that image of like him. It was also Islamic. The one where he was. His back was to the camera. That's a very Islamic pose that you didn't show his face as well. I'm sure he was intentional about that, you know, being Muslim. So. Okay. Anybody else? So, no uh, question. Yeah. How have you seen uh, media companies uh, accept hip hop and hip hop media in their, in their, I don't know, stuff, in their stuff, as opposed to like back then when hip hop was, wasn't as mainstream? Well, he's asking, you know, how did media companies accept hip hop? Um, and how has it changed over time? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and I think that might really go to you because you 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 uh, wrote for Market Watch and all that. So, you know, how's that changed? It seems like now, just from my observation, everybody's trying to do a little to be edgy. I'm going to put like a little hip hop thing in the back. I'm going to have Jay Z or Snoop, or I'm going to have some music in the background. Whereas once upon a time, it was like. We, you know, there were radio stations that used to brag that they didn't play rap, mm -hmm. including KBLX here. Remember back in the days, it's like, we do not, Quiet Storm, we do not play rap, right? Now, like, now everybody want to be like, oh, we've been down with this from day one. You know, this is our stuff. So, so how have you seen the change? Yeah. Right? Two chains is selling accounting Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, now, look, hip hop rules are mainstream. It is today, but. It's hard to imagine for many a time when it was really not embraced and it was really an outsider moment. And that's also, you know, I hear from photographers all the time, like I couldn't sell these photos anywhere. I was taking photos of the music that I love, that I felt, um, same with writers. We were writing, we were doing all this because we love, we were fans, right? We were fans, but a lot of times you couldn't sell the photos um, and, and it also gave way to this great entrepreneurial moment. You know, that's why all those mag rap pages, Ego Trip, Beat Down, Stress, like a lot of magazines you don't hear about anymore, but The Source, I mean, yeah. they were all born because, you know, magazines like Jet, Ebony, you know, respectable outlets didn't want hip hop on their, on their covers or in their pages. Um, and same with fashion, you know, that's, that's another great irony that um, I find so interesting. Um, you know, nowadays, like ev everyone, you know, Gucci, Yves Saint Laurent, they're begging artists to sit in their front row, wear their clothing. Um, but you know, you go, you think back to this time when like they were purposely saying, do not wear our clothing. Yeah. Ralph Lauren, right? Do not like, they would not buzz you in. Timberland wasn't a, was a big fan and now, you go to some parts of the country, you can get purple Timberlands, orange Timberlands, you can get pink Timberlands, all kind of Timberlands. But this was the thing that's like, we are a hiking boot. You are ruining our brand. You know, now it's like, you know, I got me a pair of purple Timberlands, you know? I mean, yeah. that's how it is, you know? Yeah. No, and I mean, and it also, you know, it gave birth again to this entrepreneurial moment with um, clothing, right? Carl Kanai. Fubu, April Walker, um, Aniche, like all those brands that came up because you know they saw they saw the market, but then finally when the big brands did recognize it, killed a lot of those brands or it you know minimized them, um, and you're seeing that play out now, right? When you don't support those brands or those companies that were down with hip hop for the right reasons you see that they've taken a piece of culture and not the rest. Right. Let's check out another one. I had to put them in there. I am Yes. 
<laughs> um, and I actually don't know what year this was, but probably like 95, I'm guessing, 96. Maybe 94, 95. 94. Yeah. You remember, the, remember Pulse magazine? Yeah. That was Pulse. a Pulse cover. Oh, that was Pulse cover. This one, yeah. Wow. R.I.P. Guru. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He had a, a good love for the Bay. He did a lot of stuff yes. with folks out here in the Bay Area uh, all the time. And uh, he was solid people. His brother still teaches down at Stanford. That's right. You know, Harry Elam. Harry Elam. And Premier uh, is a great guy too. The sound of New York comes from Texas. That's yeah. the funny thing. He's a, he's a Texas guy. And one thing I remember about uh, Premier is that he was at the house one time and he saw like my cassette co collection. I had all this stuff when I MC and everybody else did back in the seventies. He goes, "Let me take those tapes and I'll master them for you." And I was like, <laughs> "And you know, he wasn't that big then. It was like, nah, you can't have my tapes. You gotta take my tapes." And it's like, "You sure I can master them for you?" It's like, "No." Nah. And now all those tapes are losing their luster. <laughs> And then, you know, now it's Premier. It's like, okay. Premier could have, you know, now it's too late. Now you got to pay him. <laughs> it's like, I could master them for you, but you got to write a check. <laughs> Moral of the story, you got to, you know, you got to recognize the stars before they blow up. Yeah. You know. Two good cats, though. Two yeah. really, really Solid brilliant people. cats that uh, created some wonderful music. Yeah. You know, before I left California, I mean, I was a true fan. Of these cats. I was just like, wow, mesmerized and got to know as well, you right. know. Got to know him just as a yeah. you know, someone to chat with about just life and so stuff. Texas with uh Premier is from and Guru is from Boston yeah. created the sound of New York. Yeah. I'll let you all sit about <laughs> think about that for a minute. Yeah. Stand clear of the closing door. <laughs> um, um, more more Fuji's. Um what was this shot for? Uh, this was probably for the label, you know, um, probably some label work. Um, anyways, this was on my roof when I lived in lower Manhattan. And uh, this is indeed the Fuji. No, it's just a film. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. <laughs> oh, Fuji ah, film. Fuji film. Oh, look at you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> ain't that at your son? <laughs> you see the blues, huh? Yeah. All right, hey, man. What's that on his hat? Malcolm? No, it's probably one of these brands that I'm talking about. Um, no, it looks like a little character, like a little. I'll, I'll look character at some of the other proof sheets and get back to you on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is your Dell cover. Uh, yeah, that's Dell. Uh, that's the project that we shot in Oakland. That's one of those uh, covers that I was really happy about because they took one of my playful images, which I have in the book and produced a cover with it, and that's sort of also like one of those little uh, pluses when you can give them images that they enjoy and appreciate, but then at the same time, they'll take on your dark room work, because I was a true fan of the dark room, always played in the dark room, and played with film, and hand colored, and... So you knew how to develop it yourself? Oh, indeed, indeed. Okay. I know how to process film, and print it, and all of that. I was that a huge fan of the dark room. That is a <laughs> oh, far better. My numbers, my numbers are way different. <laughs> Sorry, son. But you know, I know I'm gonna bring my film to call. You know, like man, no, no. To me yeah. no, no, it's 24 hours. Yeah. 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 Exactly. No, but there, you know, there's but this resurgence of people shooting on film now. But yeah, yeah, this dark it's, room, it's, it's never like you know, finding dark rooms is is hard now. Yeah. My father left me yeah. with about. 20 cameras that are all film cameras, all this stuff, but I like to take a picture, look at it and go, I don't like that and change it. I can't, I can't do that whole, you know, wait for three hours and, and you, set the exposure you, yourself. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, but you know, one of the things. You don't manual and watch you work. <laughs> but what I, about I, 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 I got a camera game. That's right, that's right. Part of the, so, and I'll show a photo later is, um, I, you know, I was thinking as I looked at all these contact sheets, is how many of these would have been deleted? Yeah. Um, you know, now we delete so many photos, and like a lot of these photos, you know, weren't significant until many, many years later. Um, there were certain artists that were like unknown at the time. Nas, um, yeah. 
was an unknown artist that would have definitely been deleted out of many a contact sheet before 93. Um, but yeah, now. But, but show of hands, how many of you all, you know, I know I'm not the only one, so don't leave me out here hanging, but you will take a picture of everything, knowing like, I don't know if this block is gonna change. You know, this lady in the front, I better give her a picture because she might be running for president, and then you'd be like, I had this picture. She was here, you know. Am I the only one that like will take a picture of everything and keep it, or? Raise your hand, be out there. You, you're a picture hoarder like I am, right? Picture hoarders unite. Don't throw your fist up. You know. <laughs> I'd be like, take a picture and have like a thousand photos on my camera, you know, so. Can we go back? Yes. Before we get to Redman. Who from Oakland can say, tell you where that uh, photo is taken? By uh, Chinatown. Oh, Chinatown. Is it Chinatown or Lake Mary? Chinatown. Chinatown. Okay. Interesting, I passed by there. I think it was yesterday, and I said, it's, it's the building, thing. everything, the house, the building, the entire set, it's all right there. And I said, I should revisit this and just shoot it, and yeah. post it and say, who did I shoot here? <laughs> you know, because I'm trying the social media thing, I don't really know it that well. <laughs> but if you think about it, so I'm going to do that, I'm going to see how many of y'all respond. <laughs> but you know, if you think about some of the things, imagine if you took that picture, like when they had like the Malibu Grand Prix out in East Oakland, which is gone, or when they had Pete Escovito's on Lakeshore, or even the Quick Whack, you know, like all that stuff is gone, and you're like, look at the, like, the old two short video, and be like, that was that, right? right? And that might be the only image, you know, because you all had that film and you didn't, you weren't picture hoarders like I am. So. Yeah, I'm not sure if the actual shot is in on the slideshow, but the right. actual image that was the cover, I do have, and that, it's still standing, they keep it up, and uh, it's right there at Lane Tolley. Okay. Yeah. Question real quick. Did you do the, uh, the finish, the artwork for the actual album cover too? Or did you yeah. take the photo? Well, no, I took the photo, but go back to that last image. No, I'll put up an image, George. You can leave that there. Oh, it's fine. Right. Yeah. So that image there, this is the cover, right? Wasn't that for the? Uh, didn't they use this one right here for the single, though? Yeah. That's inside. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you might know more about it than me. No, it was beautiful. Work. But this is uh, this is one of the covers, and then the that one right? the gazebo shot is the okay, other. Gotcha. Yeah. So I didn't do the type for it, but I did do this photograph for it. So you see how it's sort of shaped and stretched? So I wasn't on drugs when I was in the dark room. But, it wasn't Photoshop. But I would, uh, no I would just, sort of, you. You did. I would just sort of curve the paper in the larger. Mm. So that it would sort of bow. Right? And then I would take these oils and hand color and just do what came up. And then that would, that would be the deal. So you that, I was just so happy that they used I didn't get paid for it. <laughs> But we're doing Photoshop, he's like, man, huh? Yeah, exactly. Man. Exactly. No, but you know what? That, some that's a great that. transition into this photo, actually, because this photo, before Photoshop, um, they actually, this is Red Man, uh, cover of There is a Dark Side, um, which is a riff on the Maggot Brain uh, Funkadelic album mm -hmm. cover. Um, but they, you know, Danny Clinch, the photographer, talks about because there was no Photoshop, there was no way to fake this image. They actually buried, like, created a hole in the ground, buried Redman up to his neck, wow. and um, and did this photo session. He's like, you know, it actually was really um, freaked him out, you know, because when he, like, when he was under there and felt that moment, like, any time a camera assistant or somebody would get too close, like he could feel the earth. So that's a real scream. That's a real <laughs> scream, and he was like, do not get any close. Like he was freaking out, and um, and you know, Danny was saying, he's like, you know, I would have just photoshopped that today, but we really did bury him, and I think this was out in um, Liberty Park too, or like near, like out near there. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. I don't want to be burying me like no. that. <laughs> no, sir. So you know, Photoshop will have Carl go in the lab and do his new little magical right, right. Back then, right? Well, or like, or like the Wu Tang shot, like that. You know, the photographer put Vaseline on the lens. 
Really? Because you couldn't, yeah. Oh, wow. To get that fun. shot, yeah. Did you put Vaseline on your lens? You wash it off, too. <laughs> I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> Try to make it look like it's raining when it's sunny. <laughs> all the tricks, all yeah. the tricks. Tell me some more, Claude. Um, some more tricks. No, I'm just messing. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. um, you know, this is a very famous shot of uh, Tupac by Danny Clinch. Um, I always, you know, there's always this like, which city claims Tupac? I feel like in the Bay, we gotta say it's the Bay. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. What? Uh, <laughs> Careful now. I can't protect you. <laughs> <laughs> As a native New York, I can definitively say Pac is an Oakland yeah. of oh, Bay Area. Yeah. yeah, he is. He's right here. Yeah. I got yeah. his first yeah. business card still. Yes. Uh, right. You know what I mean? He would claim the Bay. I have interviews with Pac Marincy. who lived. Next door, him and his brother live next door where they say they are from the bed. So that's it. Yeah, we're good on that. We're good with that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, then, you know, this. What's the story behind this? When you took oh, this, this photo. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm like, next. <laughs> Know who wore these underwear better, <laughs> Marky Mark? Because remember, he had the Funky Bunch and he had the Calvin Klein, right? He was the first sagger or pop over oh, Marky Mark. Come on now, <laughs> okay? Marky Mark read Calvin Klein, these are Carl Panay. Oh, that's right. yes. It's all okay. Case. So, no, I'm actually glad we went back to it because this is a perfect example. So, Tupac, you know, loved that, like supporting uh, you know, black businesses, black designers. And so Carl Kanai and also April Walker, he did all their ad campaigns. He, um, you know, for free. Like he, he was just like, I'm gonna represent you guys in independent businesses. Um, so you, you know, Tupac was a big proponent of um, Carl Kanai. April Walker's on the comeback too, you know that, right? I love April Walker, Shout yes, out to yes. She's incredible, Walker Wear. One of the few women uh, you know, in the streetwear game, a lot of people didn't know that it was by a woman when they saw Walker Wear. Um, but this, you know, this photo, this was taken on a large format camera, um, the kind where you like put the cloth like, you know, over your head, you get kind of get into the camera. Um, and Danny Clinch tells a story, you know, this was originally for um, uh, a Rolling Stone, not for a cover, but for an inside photo. Um, and he was like, you know, Tupac came to my studio by himself, which, you know, was rare for like artists to roll without, you know, their crew. Not all, not no, all, but perhaps but, now not, but yeah. back in the day, folks would roll solo. Yeah. Yeah. They roll by themselves. He, you know, he came, you know, they came solo. Yeah. So, um, you know, so he tells a story, you know, Tupac showed up and he was by himself. Um, he also was really interested in the camera. You know, this idea, he just thought it was really, you know, when you have these big setups, and, you know, Carl, you can speak better than me, but um, it creates sort of this um, seriousness, I guess, of, of this moment of a portrait, you know, someone taking your portrait versus, like, you know, an iPhone, like, it's not that serious. But so, um, he's like, you know, Tupac was really um, enamored by this camera, by this large format camera, and he was, like, trying it on um, and, you know, checking it out. And he was saying, you know, there was this moment where he was changing. He had like a jacket or something, and he noticed Danny Clinch noticed his tattoo and said, like, can we take a photo of of you with the tattoo? Oh, wow. okay. And um, and it was, you know, created um, this moment, which is kind of a quiet moment. Um, and it, you know, turned into when he passed away, they ended up putting it on the cover of Rolling Stone, sort of to memorialize him. Well, there you have it. When he was sagging, he was promoting black business. <laughs> You're letting people know this is not from the moon. This is it's called Kanai, yo. Um, uh, 
Um, this is this is one of those great just uh, spur of the moment shoots. Um, Al Pereira, who's an incredible photographer. Um, this is on a, on the set of a video shoot, so you can see a lot of the for, like most of the frames uh, in the contact sheet. He's on the set of a video shoot. He's got you know girls there and whatnot. Um, but there is this moment where he's like, I need a little little catch up, little shape up. Let's go in the back, and they allowed the photographer to go with them. This was um, Scoob. Scoob and Scrap were brothers. They were his dancers, uh, Kane's dancers, Niall Pereira's. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, and just caught caught this this moment, this like bonding uh, moment, you know, between two friends. Um, and uh, again, just a moment that a lot of photographers wouldn't be allowed access to today. Now, now Big Daddy Kane was often considered the Clark Gable of rap. He was like that heartthrob. So, right. did, was he aware of that and was very cognizant? Like, yes. Oh, I got that. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, if Idris Alba walks in a room and Big Daddy Kane is there with Tupac, who would you go for? Who would you rather? <laughs> huh? I'm just curious. You know? I'm just curious. <laughs> or D'Angelo. Or D'Angelo. <laughs> Alright, this is going left. Let's bring it, let's bring, let's bring it back. <laughs> um, but I will point out also these pants are Dapper Dan. If you look really close, it's a little Fendi, little Fendi print. Um, so I thought that was also super cool. Uh, this is like the Mona Lisa of hip hop. Um, this is Biggie by Baron Claiborne, which was photographed for the cover of Rat Pages magazine. Um, and this was actually Biggie's last shoot in New York before he, Baron Claiborne tells the story how Big left his studio in Lower Manhattan and actually got on a plane right after this, um, where he came to LA, where he was killed. But, you know, this- he came to the Bay first. Yeah, his last interview was on KML with uh, with uh, Sway and uh, Big Daddy, and then he went. Um, I think he went to Wild first, where they filmed it, and then he went to LA. That was that was yeah, because I remember he was so excited about having um, going back to Cali, but we hadn't heard it, and he's sitting there and he's going, "Wait until you hear this song. Everybody in Cali is going to love it." And yeah, I have that whole tape. We were there that morning. He was real excited. And then I remember Franzen told him, said, be careful in L.A. because he was hanging in L.A. And he said, L.A. is not what you think. And then that Sunday, you know, that, that's when it happened. Yeah. That was crazy. He used to call me Cali. Did he really? Yeah, when we, after we met, he used to always say, yo, what's up, Cali? You know, we run into each other on the street, and just in passing or whatever after shooting. Because he was just, you know, he was just, you know, curious about this cat that's in New York. Right. Now working. I remember that when you moved, when you, I remember when you and um, uh, Danielle Smith came to New York, it was like, it was a very, it was a moment because it was like, you guys were like from Cali. We were like, oh, you're from Cali, you're from Cali, you're from yeah, Cali. I didn't wear, uh, and, you know, I didn't wear uh, Tim's. I wore sneakers with no socks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was a Cali kid. I had something yeah. to say and something to do. <laughs> and so that winter came and then you got yourself a pair of Tim's. <laughs> <laughs> he understood. Or, or, I missed some damn Tim's. But he was like, yo, what's up, Callie? I remember sitting on Houston and, and Broadway, just seeing him. And he would just be like, yo, what's up, Callie? I said, you're going to get out there. You're going to get out there. You're going to love it. How did, you, uh, feel, how did he feel about this picture when he, when he took that? Because you know, he looks very sober. So he, he, he loved the idea. The concept was to shoot him as, uh, as a West African king. That's what Baron Claiborne uh, wanted to do. Um, and he, so he, you know, was really studied about how you photograph, you know, certain, certain lighting, certain portrayals, um, and the, it, this photo almost didn't happen because, uh, Puffy, Diddy, did not want him photographed like this because he thought he was going to look like Burger King. And he was like, you can't do this, you can't do this shoot, you're gonna, you're gonna, this is gonna, you're gonna look like, you're gonna look like a fool, you're gonna look like Burger, Big Fat Burger King, with this crown on, on the cover of the magazine. And so there was a lot of negotiation, finally, you know, Big was like, let me just try, let me see. 
and um, it ended up with this, with this shot. Um, and, you know, it ended up as the cover of Rap Pages magazine, but if you look at the contact sheets, there is this, like, moment, smiling, oh, wow. yes, yeah, smiling Biggie <laughs> over there, <laughs> which, like... <laughs> now, that could have been for coming to America. <laughs> but you know, everyone everyone that knows Vicky is always like, that's the Vicky that we knew. That that that's fun the loving. fun loving, joking, cracking jokes. Um, that's that's the Vicky that, that I knew. Um, you know, so it also this this speaks about choice and editorial choice of what images make it out there into the world and onto the cover of magazines. Um, and sort of the behind the scenes decisions that are made to create so this, history. So this comes to another question. Um, if anybody has one, raise your hand. When Pac was taking some pictures in this book, he's smiling and his people tell him, you can't be looking all soft. You gotta kinda, you know, harden it up a little. So by the time you see the end, he has that same sober pose. And it seemed like a lot of people were very intentional about not smiling when they took these pictures, which becomes this image. So we, we can never, you know, be smiling. We always got to look hard. And, you know, that seems to be an across-the-board choice. You know, um, how much of that is the artist versus how much of that is the fascination with people outside the community who would look at a black man and say, you know, because I've had people say, you know, we need you to be more street. Or you don't sound black, or you know what do you mean you don't sound black? You need, meaning you need to be harder. So there seems to be a fascination with people to look a certain way and act a certain way. So my opinion, people live vicariously through this image. So if Biggie smiles, you would have people outside Bed Stuy or outside of East Oakland or the quote unquote hood who would actually say he's not hood. Right. And you're like, well, what are you basing this on? Because he's smiling. So. How how do we reconcile ourselves with that? I mean, I well, I'll just say, you know, there's there's that, there's that, that image, um, is it Michael B. Jordan? I think it's Michael B. Jordan and um, someone, someone probably knows, but there was a photo a couple of years ago, uh, them embracing. They were like hugging, uh, I think it was in a magazine, but there were, you know, and it was, um, everyone had this problem of like these two black men having this moment embracing and looking soft and having this, you know, mo emotion, like showing emotion and being human. Um, and, and, you know, they got a lot of comments and stuff. And um, yeah, I think now, you know, a lot of artists are, I mean, we joke that they're like, the new crowd is like in their feelings and things like that, but there is this trend towards showing. Um, I'm gonna say this. Yeah. Uh, it goes both ways sometimes. And for example, that image of KRS One that's in my book here. Yeah, he has a picture of KRS One smiling. So I have never seen that. You know, I know that brother for if 30 we can, years. If we can, you know, if we bring, you know, it's in us. It's in us. We laughing and having a good time for the most part. But oftentimes we turn on that grill for the cover, for that editorial. So if you gravitate towards making it light and loose, then you can get that. Because it's there. It's not like that shit's fake. It's actually in us for the most part. We're in a jovial space because we're happy about either what we're creating or doing. So those moments definitely do happen. Now, when it gets to the, the label, then it's for us to make sure that we share two-thirds of those jovial moments and persuade you to push it to an image that is jovial and fun-loving because it's in us, it's there. Now, oftentimes we want to show and be hard and come across with that, with that grill, so to speak, so that we put out this image that says, like, this is what I'm speaking about, I'm speaking on, and I want to give you that hard take on it. But outtakes, I, I got them, I got them, <coughs> hundreds. So you need to do smile. a smile book. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So anyways, I'm just saying those moments yeah. are definitely there. It's not hidden. And I remember that uh, when Paul was shooting for, you know, 
talk about uh, more, the when Carl was shooting more for uh, mainstream magazines, they would uh, sometimes tell him, well, we need more smiley people. Because they was looking ma ma uh, at his uh, maybe music portraits, and there was always this attitude there. And remember that they sometimes would say, well, you need to sh let's sh show us some more smiley yeah, on occasions, I mean, it works both ways. That's that's kind of how I want to leave that. Um, I don't want it to be that you know, you're shot, you know, you're shut down from the smiley picture. So the flip side to that is that when I was at KMEM, an artist would come up. There was a push, mostly by non-black folks who were in decision-making position, to really say, like, we need something more street. I've seen that yeah. time and time again. And you know, I can name a whole litany of artists who have walked in with with music from Master P on down. They're like, uh, you know, we need something that's a little bit more street. But the people making that demand weren't from the streets, right? right? right, right. So it was always a very interesting scenario because it's almost like if you didn't go that way, then you were risking not having airplay. I mean, often that yeah. uh, often that moment would be like we would all chat. Us, photographers that you've chosen to participate in this book. Rolling Stone was a prime example of that on occasion where they would go for that hard street image and it wasn't necessarily the visual that made the most sense for the story. So that was one of those where you said, wow, yeah. you had the choice, it's right there in front of you, but you pull something hard to sort of kind of keep that, either that image alive or for whatever reason, but you know, once it's, we do the shoots, and it goes to the editor, and then there's an art director, and then there's an editor in chief, and then they make some decisions. Yeah. You know, Jonathan Van Meter. You know, when they, these guys were all at Five Magazine, they were playing early. Quincy Jones. You know, there was some lightheartedness, and then you know George Pitts. Also, we think about him. So there was some lightheartedness that started to flow through the imagery because that magazine was controlled by these, say, five individuals that had. The choice to say, let's go this route. Like that image of Jay Z that I shot, where he's just with a big smile and jovial, this brilliant, beautiful man that felt quite comfortable with his position was chosen to be the image opposed to being one that sort of represented Rockefeller in that way that was hard. So, what I want to do is, can we jump to maybe the women? Because we're 20 minutes over, and I want you all to be able to talk to them. But let's look at just a few. This is, this is, by the way, just the quick dichotomy I was talking about earlier about Jay on the right with uh, his first shoot and then, the, you know, one of his more recent shoots um, without all the stuff. Nas. L.L. <laughs> yeah, so th this is um, a photo of uh, Latifa. The contact sheets show her mom, who passed away a couple years ago, um, and her dancers. Um, you know, and and so, you know, showing like the people that the, the the support system, the people that were around these artists who made them who they were, who they trusted, um, and in these you know outtakes of of the in between shots. Um, so yeah, I wanted to get you know as many women in this book as I could. Uh, you know, Mary J was very influential with her her style. Um, Aaliyah, this is one of Aaliyah's first photo shoots when she was 15 here. Um, the photographer, uh, this was taken in London, and uh, the photographer, Eddie O'Chair, was saying that, you know, he kept hearing the rumors about R. Kelly, and she was wearing a wedding ring, and he as a photographer didn't, like, didn't want to, you know, so he used his camera to kind of document that moment. Um, there, I, I, there's a lot more photos of women in the book, and obviously more women in hip hop than are even than in the book. Um, but you know, I, I wanted to, for the sake of time. And they got some really dope uh, other photos of Aaliyah and others in there. Yeah. So let's get one, one or two more questions, and then we're going to wrap up. Go ahead. Photographers at this time that were photographing her? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Delphine Fawundu was one of the, um, she has a photo of uh, 
Ma Deep in the book, and she was like everywhere, you know, photographing for all the magazines, and she's an amazing photographer to this day. Um, Sheila Priest Wright was documenting the Houston hip hop scene back then. Um, those those were sort of like the two. Uh, Ra 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 Raquel Clinton uh, was was a uh, big name back then. I mean, there were there were quite a few you know women and quite a few black women that were um, you know that were very much much well, out she, there. Sheena wasn't Sheena Lester wasn't a photographer, uh, but she had a lot of. Yeah, yeah. When editor, yeah, editors, um, Sheena Lester, Danielle Smith, Shawnee Saxon. I mean, you know, there were, yeah, there were a lot of, um, you know, women. I had a lot of great, you know, black women editors that were my bosses, um, that you know gave me great writing opportunities. And um, yeah, you know, it's 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 it, again, it's a question that comes up all the time, and I feel like the mainstream likes to portray it like there were no women and no women of color. Like it was all, like you got a few artists, but that was it. But um, yeah, when the industry was smaller, there Just was- Just to give you an example yeah. of what happens when you have behind the scenes, there's an iconic photo uh, that was on the source, uh, Grandmaster Flash, um, Africa Bambada, and uh, Cool Herc, mm -hmm. right? That's the triumph, of, right, the three pioneers. Mm -hmm. Well, the person who set that up was Cool Herc's sister, Cindy. Yeah. She's the one that brought them together in the whole nine. And you know, that's those behind the scenes things. Like, you, didn't, you haven't seen anything like that since, but you know, that, that like becomes- You mentioned thing. earlier, the Leslie Pitts yeah. was huge in orchestrating a lot of things that happened in the industry. And uh, she passed on, how old was she? Maybe 30, yeah. late 30s? Mm -hmm. And uh, she was, Quite brilliant early on, and just making sure that folks were in the magazines and doing the little steps. Because it's, it's hard for an artist to structure that uh, lifestyle along with getting the work done yeah. Yeah. and spend that money properly. But you know, I think your question, I mean, also brings up a good point of like um, equity in photographers who gets to photograph what, what opportunities, you know, and who gets to document. Um, people that look like them, and it's a, it's a really important point. And just, I mean, it's it's too bad, but this this year was the first time ever in history that um, a black woman uh, photographed for the cover of Rolling Stone. Dana Scruggs, right? Um, you know, it was the first time that a, a black person photographed for the cover of Vogue. So the fact that we're having all these firsts in 2019 is really sad. I mean, through there, there, there were black women, there were you know black photographers, but we're still really behind. In, and one yeah. person we got to shout out since we're in the Bay, who I think really captured the essence of the Bay in the 90s in particular, is Tracy Barco. Oh, and yeah. we got to look at her stuff because she. Stay in, your, stay in your ass up there, sister. <laughs> Tracy Bartlett, I didn't even know. Right there. She captured a lot of history. So, yeah, um, a lot of stuff would just be a race. I didn't even know you was there, see? I always say good things about you. <laughs> I didn't even see her, so there you go. Um, let's give it up for Carl Posey and uh, Vicky Posey.